Women in Iran discusses the history, contribution, aspects, and roles of women in Iran. Women in Iran have always played fundamental, crucial, and representative roles in the long history of Iran. History Pre-Islamic Iran archaeological excavations at Shari Sukta, burnt city, a prehistoric settlement in the Sistan Balochistan province of southeastern Iran has revealed that the women of the 4th-3rd millennium BCE community maintained a high level of socio-economic status. Of the seals discovered in graves there, 90% were in the possession of women, who in turn made up over 60% of the population. The distribution of the seals, which as instruments of trade and government represented economic and administrative control, reveals that these women were the more powerful group in the prehistoric society. The position of woman in ancient Persia was apparently in no wise inferior to her standing in the Vedic times of early India. As among other oriental nations, however, submission to her lord and master is taken for granted and the woman who is obedient to her husband comes in for a special need of praise in the Avastar and elsewhere, but it is perfectly evident. As a rule, there was not that subjection which results in loss of personality and individuality. The early Achaemenid era Persepolis fortification and treasury tablets refers to women in three different terms, Muchu, Irti and Duxis. The first refers to ordinary women, the second to unmarried members of the royal family, and the last to exist to married women of royalty. Such differentiated terminology shows the significance of marital status and of a woman's relationship to the king. The tablets also reveal that women of the royal household traveled extensively and often personally administered their own estates. The queen and her ladies-in-waiting are known to have played polo against the emperor and his courtiers. The only limits on the extent of the authority exercised by the king's mother were set by the monarch himself. In the tablets, non-royals and the ordinary workers are mentioned by their rank in the specific workgroup or workshops they were employed. The rations they received are based on skill and the level of responsibility they assumed in the workplace. The professions are divided by gender and listed according to the amount of ration. Records indicate that some professions were undertaken by both sexes while others were restricted to either male or female workers. There are male and female supervisors at the mixed workshops as evident by the higher rations they have received with little difference in the amount of rations between the two sexes. There are also occasions where women listed in the same category as men received less rations and vice versa. Female managers have different titles presumably reflecting their level of skill and rank. The highest ranking female workers in the texts are called Arashera. They appear repeatedly in the texts, were employed at different locations and manage large groups of women, children and sometimes men working in their units. They usually receive high rations of wine and grains exceeding all the other workers in the unit including the males. In addition, pregnant women also received higher rations than others. Women with newborn children also received extra rations for a period of one month. A few experts claim that it was Cyrus the Great who 12 centuries before Islam established the custom of covering women to protect their chastity. According to their theory, the veil passed from the Achaemenids to the Hellenistic Seleucids. They, in turn, handed it to the Byzantines, from whom the Arab conquerors inherited it, transmitting it over the vast reaches of the Arab world. The Sassanid princess Purandokht, daughter of Khosrau II, ruled the Persian Empire for almost two years before resigning. Also, during the Sasanian dynasty many of the Iranian soldiers who were captured by Romans were women who were fighting along with the men. Persian women are depicted in many masterpieces of Persian paintings and miniatures. These are often used as sources to trace through the sequence of women's fashion from earlier periods. Drawing a Persian girl dressed in colors with Persian wine at hand has been a favorite style for portraying love.
At the Battle of Cte Siphon the victorious Roman soldiers prized young Persian women, seizing them as war booty. A bust from the National Museum of Iran of Queen Musa, wife of Phraates IV of Parthia. The Persian lady portrayed in five medallions on this bowl has a hairstyle that suggests that she may have been a queen in the Sassanid royal family at the time of King Narsa. Iranian woman as depicted in Sassanid floor mosaic. Portrait a female member of Shah's family one of 274 vintage photographs. Brooklyn Museum. Kushra discovers Shirin bathing from pictorial cycle of eight poetic subjects. Mid-18th century. Brooklyn Museum. After the Islamic conquest. Iranian women overseas Iranian women as dancers were highly regarded in China. During the Tang Dynasty bars were often attended by Iranian or Sogdian waitresses who performed dances for clients. Poets like Li Bai flirted and wrote about them in their poems. World dances were often performed by these girls. Some of these blue-eyed and blonde-haired Persian and Greek girls danced in bars and clubs in China during this period. During the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, there are examples of Chinese emperors marrying Persian women. The young Chinese emperor Lu Chang of the Southern Han Dynasty had a Persian lover in his harem. He nicknamed her Meiju, which means beautiful so. Lu likes the Persian girl because of her olive skin color. He and the Persian girl all also liked to force young couples to go naked and played with them in the palace and he favored her by doting on her. Multiple women originating from the Persian Gulf lived in Guangzhou's foreign quarter. They were all called Persian women. Original from the University of Michigan, perhaps because most of them came from near the Persian Gulf. During the Five Dynasties, Lu Chang, king of the Nan Han, had in his harem a young Persian woman, whom he doted upon so much. From the 10th to 12th century, Persian women were to be found in Guangzhou, and in the 12th century large numbers of Persian women lived there, noted for wearing multiple earrings and quarrelsome dispositions. It was recorded that the poesses Yufu at Quangchu make holes all round their ears. There are some who wear more than 20 earrings. Descriptions of the sexual activities between Lu Chang and the Persian woman in the song. Dynasty book The Kim Gai Lu by T.A. Oku were so graphic that the memoirs of the research department of the Toyobunko issue 2 refused to provide any quotes from it while discussing the subject. Lu had free time with the Persian women by delegating the task of governing to others. The Wu Taishi says that Lu Chang, emperor of the Southern Han Dynasty reigning at Canton, about A.D. 970, Dot was dallying with his palace girls and Persian women in the inner apartments, and left the government of his state to the ministers. The history of the Five Dynasties stated that Lu Chang then with his court ladies and Poessu woman, indulged in amorous affairs in the harem. A family of Iranian descent in China was known for the three polymaths it produced. One of them was a woman. Their ancestors adopted the son name Li when they moved to China. She was a poet and her name was Li Shunxian. She was known for being beautiful, and had an older brother named Li Hsun who wrote a book on drugs of foreign lands, and a younger brother Li Xian. They lived at the court of the royal family of the former Xu in Chengdu. Li Shunxian also was a poet. Their family had come to China in 880 and were a wealthy merchant family. Li Xian dealt with Taoist alchemy, perfumes and drugs. Of the Chinese Li family in Quanzhou, Li Nu, the son of Li Lu, visited Persia in 1376, married a Persian girl, and returned to Quanzhou with her. Li Nu was the ancestor of the Ming dynasty reformer Li Qi. Kaiar dynasty During the Kaiar dynasty, Malik Jahan Khanom as queen mother exerted serious political influence during the reign of her son, from 1848 until her death in 1873. An example of an early reform introduced by Reza Shah was the forced unveiling of women by a special decree on January 8, 1936 which, as the name suggests, involved the police force pulling the hijab away even from religious women. 
by force, women's involvement in society in general increased. Iranian women increasingly participated in the economy, the education sector and in the workforce. Levels of literacy were also improved. Examples of women's involvement. Women acquired high official positions, such as ministers, artists, judges, scientists, athletes, etc. Under Reza Shah's successor Mohammad Reza Shah many more significant reforms were introduced. For example in 1963, the Shah granted female suffrage and soon after women were elected to the Majlis and the Upper House, and appointed as judges and ministers in the cabinet. In 1967 Iranian family law was also reformed which improved the position of women in Iranian society. It was included in the civil code and was designed to protect wives, children and female divorcees. The general thrust of the reforms were to promote equality between men and women in society. The family protection laws of 1967 and 1973 required a husband to go to court to divorce rather than simply proclaim the triple talak of I divorce, the three times, as stipulated by traditional Sharia law. It allowed a wife to initiate divorce and required the first wife's permission for a husband to take a second wife. Child custody was left to new family protection courts rather than automatically granted to the father. The minimum age at which a female could marry was raised from 13 to 15 in 1967 and to 18 in 1975. Under the Islamic Republic of Iran following the 1979 Iranian Revolution Iran became an Islamic Republic. During the era of post-revolution rule, Iranian women have had more opportunities in some areas and more restrictions in others. One of the striking features of the revolution was the large-scale participation of women from traditional backgrounds in demonstrations leading up to the overthrow of the monarchy. The Iranian women who had gained confidence and higher education under Pahlavi era participated in demonstrations against Shah to topple monarchy. The culture of education for women was established by the time of revolution so that even after the revolution, large numbers of women entered the civil service in higher education, and in 1996 14 women were elected to the Islamic Consultative Assembly. Ayatollah Khomeini seemed to express appreciation for women's issues after he took power. In May 1979, the day of celebration for Iranians Women's Day, and the day after he imposed hijab on women, Khomeini addressed his audience and spoke about Fatima. After the death of her father, Fatima lived for 75 days. She was in this world overcome with sadness and grief. Gabriel, the trusted spirit, came to visit and console her and tell her of future events, so, according to this tradition, in these 75 days that she had contact with Gabriel, he came and went many times. I do not believe that anyone else except the great prophets have had such an experience, in which for 75 days Gabriel, the trusted spirit, came and went and spoke of things that would take place in the future. That would happen to her ancestors in the future. The Ayatollah spoke fondly of Fatima as a role model for women. He said that even though she was visited by the angel Gabriel, this is not what made her special. To him, her admirable qualities were twofold and supposedly represented by the visits from Gabriel, her special spiritual status and her excellent moral character. He continued to explain that Fatima could have been born with this spiritual status or Fatima could have gone through a kind of unique mystical experience. This is why the Ayatollah believed she represented the ideal female role model. Fatima's moral excellence is observed in three interconnected activities, struggle, inspiring men, and suffering. Fatima inspired her husband as a devout Muslim. Khomeini draws parallels to this inspiration with women of Iran and how they should strive to follow their religious calling like Fatima. According to UNESCO World Survey, at primary level of enrollment Iran has the highest female-to-male ratio in the world among sovereign nations with a girl-to-boy ratio of 1.22. 
1.00. By 1999, Iran had 140 female publishers, enough to hold an exhibition of books and magazines published by women. As of 2005, 65% of Iran's university students and 43% of its salaried workers were women. And as of early 2007, nearly 70% of Iran's science and engineering students are women. 27.1% female ministers in government put Iran among first 23 countries in early 2000s. 2.8 minus 4.9 percent female parliamentarians in past 15 years put it among least 25 countries. In 2009 Fatima Bodaghi became vice president for legal affairs and a top advisor to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Maya Mojtahidzada who runs the women's ministry was also selected as an advisor to the president. At least one observer has commented on the less traditional attitude of many women in Iran compared to other Middle Eastern countries. In Iran, you could point a camera at a woman, and she would smile, in contrast to other more conservative places where women may mind this. At the beginning of the revolution, it was announced that women appearing on television would have to wear the hijab. A couple of months later it was announced that women working in government facilities and buildings would also be required to wear hijab. And a few months after that that all women had to wear the hijab in public. Restrictions on women have varied over the history of the Republic of Iran. In the first years after the revolution, females who did not cover most parts of their body were subject to punishment of imprisonment. During the presidency of Mohammad Khatami, restrictions became much less severe. There are also women in the Iranian police who deal with crimes committed by women and children. Politics Women in Iran were granted the right to vote in 1963. They were first admitted to Iranian universities in 1937. Since then, several women have held high-ranking posts in the government or parliament. Before and after the 1979 revolution, several women were appointed ministers or ambassadors. Farah Parza was the first woman to be appointed Minister of Education in 1968 and Manas Afkami was appointed Minister for Women's Affairs in 1976. Some, such as Tahiri Safarzada, Masume Ebteka, Azam Telegani, Fatima Hakayaju, El Ekoli, Fatima Javadi, Marzia Dabik and Zara Ranavad came after the revolution. Other Iranian women, including Goli Ameri and Farah Karimi hold positions in Western countries. There are currently nine women in parliament, of a total of 290 parliamentarians. This was down from 13 in the previous elections.